morning and welcome to week two um, of the uh, ASP Summer Colloquium on S2S Science and Application. Um, this week, uh, our first speaker will be uh, Magdalena Alonso Balmaceda. Um, Magdalena is a um, principal scientist at ECMWF and also the head of the Earth System Predictability section. Um, her interests lie in uh, the predict predictability and uh, initialized seamless predictions and ocean coupled reanalysis. She has made numerous contribution, important contributions in the field of ensemble generation, the analysis and evaluation of coupled reanalysis and air sea interactions, uh, and in particular, ocean initializations. Um, she's involved in a number of uh, committees and scientific steering groups, too many to list them all. Um, also, um, uh, Magdalena is known to throw great parties uh, where she is uh, serving um, specialties from Spain like Manche Manchego and uh, Rioja. Welcome, <laughs> Magdalena. <laughs> Thank you, Judith. Good that you remember. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> and yeah, Thank you, Judith and Anish and, and the organizers for inviting me to give this presentation that is uh, going to burst uh, on the initialization and forecast strategy for seamless forecasting. So this is a bit the outline of my talk. I will start setting up the scene with some introductory concepts. In, then I will talk about initialization shock, forecast drift and calibration. And then most of the talk is going to be as a example, the initialization, the, what do we do in the for the initialization of the ocean as an example of um, a slow component of their system. I would like to also compare two initialization and forecast strategies. They used, uh, in, if you want, in decadal and more in seamless uh, approaches. And if I have time, I would like to talk about ensemble generation strategies for seamless prediction. So we probably by now, you would have seen last uh, week that uh, the basis for forecast beyond weather time scales resides on the properties of a system with two time scales, with multiple time scale. Uh, on the fast uh, time scale uh, point of view, which would be the atmosphere, uh, this prediction uh, beyond weather is basically a boundary condition problem or the predictability of the second kind of loaded dice by which the forcing exerted by what the atmosphere considers boundary conditions changes the atmospheric circulation, modifying the large scale patterns of temperature and rainfall. And so the probability of occurrence of certain events deviates significantly from climatology. But uh, what are those boundary conditions? From the atmosphere, they would be a sea surface temperature, soil moisture, snow, radiative forcing, stratosphere, maybe. But uh, these components in most of them in their system models are not boundaries, are um, uh, really prognostic variables. So from the point of view of um, this um, slow component, the predictability beyond weather is, a pro is also a predictability of the first kind. That means an initial value problem. So we need to initialize the slow component. And before I go into full details, I would like you to I would like to remind you that um, these um, seamless forecast they have an additional component. It's not only predicting now uh, that this is an example. That this would be an ensemble prediction for today that we launched several realizations to estimate the PDA of the possible occurrence. But this is not is not enough. We need to compare it with what is called the climatological PDA, that would be the black curve, uh, that we estimate by in issuing a series or conducting a series of forecasts or retrospective forecasts back in time to estimate this climatological PDA of the model. And the information content is really in the difference between the model climatology and today's forecast. To initialize this, uh, uh, for this um, um, climatological PDF, we need initial conditions for this reforecast, and the quality of these initial conditions will depend very much on the quality. They usually come from reanalysis. 
and the quality of the reanalysis. So that's why reanalysis are an integral part of the seamless forecasting. Why do we need this reforecast? Uh, I mentioned uh, mostly the calibration or just uh, contrasting what is today from the traditional climatology of the model. So it's calibration, but it's also for detection of extreme events. And here we can see the um, predictions at two weeks of the um, Canadian heat wave, uh, for instance, or at seasonal forecast, the seasonal mean. We so use them, and this is very important for a skill assessment. It's not enough to issue a forecast. You need to have some knowledge of how good the quality of that forecast. And that's, uh, the reforecasts are used for that as well. Uh, then the reanalysis, they are used for monitoring climate. And of course, the reforecasts are, are very good data set for predictability and evaluation studies and to see whether the model has error or what are the future directions for improvement. So what do we, what are the requirements uh, arising from the, uh, from, from this reforecast? So what we need is the consistency. Uh, this reforecast and the real-time forecast need to be consistent. So the calibration makes sense. We also need a temporal consistency in the past uh, and faithful representation of a wide range of time scales. So the skill ass assessment makes sense and the understanding of what is going on makes sense. And this is quite challenging, especially the presence of model error and a changing observing system. And this, I will, it is obvious, but I will try to illustrate it. Um, we also need accurate and physically balanced estimate um, and associated uh, uh, um, uncertainty. So the obser observational information can be propagated into the forecast. And so the relevant processes can be reliably quantified. And how far back, as far back as possible. Uh, and the limitation there is usually computer resources. So the initialization, I, I like this uh, picture because um, what we are doing in the forecast is basically um, two ways translation from the observations into the model. That's the initialization stage. Then we propagate the information into the future, and that's the forecast stage. We do it in model space. And then we do the calibration stage, that is the translation from the model information into observation space. And the techniques, uh, both initialization and calibration, are very similar. They are based on Bayesian statistics. This, in the initialization, we call it data simulation, and this is going to be the topic of the talk where the observations collapse the uncertainty of the possible realizations, but they also correct the mean state uh, of the state where we are. This is just a very idealized cartoon of an ensemble of data simulation. But um, and this initialization step is really what distinguishes a forecast from a projection or a model simulation. This is essential in a forecast. And in, indeed, it helps. Uh, uh, it has more information and forecast than a projection or a simulation because it has that connection with the real time. But this uh, initialization may not be perfect. Um, uh, for instance, models are not perfect and that can, can create problems. Um, observations may be sufficient. And the data simulation, which is the translator itself, has deficiencies. And this is, uh, you can imagine somebody translating or a Google translation in the early times that uh, sometimes the translations are far from meaningful, uh, even if they are very objective, but they uh, need a little bit more. So uh, these uh, errors in this translation can give uh, rise to problems with initialization shock. So this cartoon shows a little bit the problems that we may have with initialization shock drift and how these two things can affect the scale. So imagine that uh, we have the real world, uh, that is this blue line. This is some uh, schematic of the phase space. We have the model attractor or the model climate, which is different from the real world because models will always be deficient representations. And as the forecast, uh, we launch a forecast and the forecast, oops, the forecast, slowly will go from the real world 
into the model climate. That could be ideal. Uh, if we have this sort of behavior, it's ideal because during this time, before it reaches the model attractor, we are going to have information about, uh, so the forecast would have information. But this is not always the case. Sometimes this um, drift may not, may not be monotonic. And in fact, we can have, that's what we call initialization shock. Uh, so uh, it's not uh, monotonic in some direction of phase space. And in fact, during this period of time, the error is worse than if we had, say, the model climatology, <laughs> for instance. And this can create problems at times, especially if we have non-linearities. Imagine uh, that uh, we have uh, the, the system is non-linear, which is, and if this initialization shock is large enough that kicks the non-linearities, we may end up having a convergence of solution to a state that is different from what we would have had with a good initialization. So we need to be careful. So what, um, I mean, basically it's difficult to define, but I try to say that uh, the consequences of initialization shock, um, because it implies that the data simulation process uh, has created imbalances in the initial conditions, not supported by the model physics. And the observation information is rapidly lost via adjustments that deteriorate the scale. What causes this initialization shock? Uh, that could be the efficient data simulation, as I mentioned, just uh, bad translation, <laughs> and that it could be because we don't have sufficient physical constraints on the data simulation, or data simulation is trying to put the scales that the model cannot support, or we are giving too much weight to the observations, or the observations have poor quality control and um, end up in wrong. <clears throat> observations being assimilated. So these steps are quite important. The weight that we give to the observation, the quality of observations and the, uh, the balances in the data simulations. Uh, there are also reasons, uh, other reasons why the initial conditions can uh, lead to initialization shock is if this had been produced with different model cycles, the one that is used by the forecast, this could happen if we use separate initialization or uncoupled data simulation where the ocean and the atmosphere are produced differently, <laughs> separately, but in, in couple mode when they are together. Or we use different model cycles that they are not related to each other. And we did some um, ex exercises then to quantify this that was in the medium range. And what we could see is the largest contribution of the initialization shock is when we use different models from the ones that have been used for initialization. But uh, couple data simulation also, uh, uh, also contributes. So this is the um, RMS error with um, different models. This one is the same model cycle, but um, separate initialization, some couple initialization. And the blue line is with couple initialization. So uh, we know that there is a path for improvement. And that's where we are. Uh, so what about drift? Uh, so much about initialization show. What about drift? We say that um, this is an example for seasonal forecast where we see Nino 3.4 and so uh, an index of ENSO, sea surface temperature. Uh, with different models. And those are some of the models that we use operationally. And you can see that the, we have biased in the first moment of the distribution, drift in the first moment of the distribution, that is called bias. And we see how this depends on lead time and it grows with lead time. And this depends also on the model cycle uh, and the model resolution. And it also depends on the phase of the seasonal cycles. So it's not always the same. If we initially lies in November, the drift that we may get is different that if we initialized in May. Uh, we also have errors in the second moment of the distribution, and this is, can be characterized by the amplitude ratio, the interannual variability between the, um, the forecast uh, interannual variability and the observations interannual variability. And you can see here, uh, these two colors scales are the same blue. The one with colder drift is the one that has larger amplitude in the seasonal, in the uh, larger error in the estimation of the amplitude. 
And we know uh, that this is because there are non-linearities that links the mean state, the variability, and the cold tongue and the strong thermocline feedback, basically. So why do I say that? Uh, first is that there are different sort of errors. And in this case is first moment and second moment of the distribution. But if we have errors in the non-linearities, then the basic uh, uh, calibration of removal of bias will not be done because the variability is affected. So this bias correction a posteriori only of the mean is insufficient if the system is non-linear. And then the other question is that one common perception is that uh, while initialization shock depends on the initialization, the drift depends only on the model. But it's not true, these two are intrinsically linked. And we can see that the same model with different initializations can mm, go to different states and different drifts. So that's important to bear in mind when we want to diagnose model errors. Okay. I know there are many considerations, but I think uh, it's a multifarious uh, aspect of problem, this initialization. So I wanted to give um, the full picture first. So uh, now we come to this issue. We want to initialize the slow components of their system. So how do we do it optimally? So in the atmosphere, the, the atmosphere scientists are very good with optimality and they have this for the bar and tangent linear, and they are able to optimize the initial conditions so they produce the best forecast uh, with an objective metric. Uh, so a lead time, a variable, and a region, they tend to use geopotential height or the energy of the, um, of the system. And it's, uh, you can um, evaluate the, the initialization very quickly. For the slow component, it's more difficult. Uh, because the tangent linear and the adjoint usually don't, uh, they are not enough, or we don't have them. Uh, but we decide to use common sense <laughs> if you want and these practical requirements. We want to, the initial condition should represent accurately the state of the real world and project into the model attractor. So th those are two requirements. This is difficult in the process of model error, as we have seen because of the initialization shock and drift. But the idea is to minimize this initialization shock. There are the other practical requirements arising from calibration that the errors should be as stationary as possible. And we also would like to have consistency between the reforecast and the real time. So we have reanalysis and that we try to do as consistent estimation as possible and representation of uncertainty. So I'm going to illustrate these aspects with the ocean. And uh, here we are. Uh, so imagine that we want to predict ENSO. And so, okay, which part of the ocean predict? Uh, and here uh, we see a half meter of sea surface temperature anomalies, daily SSD anomalies uh, on the right. And on the left is the depth of the 20 degree isothermocline anomalies. And you can see here, uh, there is this big La Nina and that happened around 2011. Can we predict this? Uh, so if you see in the depth of the 20 degree isotherm, you can see these Kelvin waves propagating both uh, in this case positive, in this case negative from east to west. Uh, the point of this slide is just to, to say, uh, it's not enough to say, okay, the uh, ocean will have larger therm thermal energy. We only need to initialize the mixed layer. Uh, we also need to initialize the dynamics. So because the dynamics is predictable, and in fact, it gives the, uh, the equator is the main source of predictability at this time scale. So how do we go about? So most of these slow components, uh, not only the ocean, but the land, you can think around the same or the sea ice, we need the model and the atmospheric fluxes from atmospheric reanalysis. Those are the best, uh, the, the first guess if you want. And with that, you get already quite a lot, but it's not enough. We also need ocean observations and that they are put together with the ocean model with data simulation methods. 
And in the case of the ocean, we have uh, these ocean observations. The main one is sea, sur sea surface temperature, but also in situ observations, uh, XBTs, Argo, moorings, and altimeter. So why do we need, why, why do I say that we need data simulation? Well, we have large uncertainty in the fluxes and also in the models that can lead to large uncertainty in the subsurface. And here, what you can see, I don't know, you see this um, plot, those are the equatorial Atlantic, the wind stress anomaly the, between two different products and the equivalent um, uh, uncertainty, if you want time series of the upper ocean heat content, which is quite large and the uncertainty is uh, equivalent to the variability that we want to predict. So the questions are, does, if we have ocean observations, can we constrain the ocean state? And the answer is yes. If we use data simulation, these two curves get, get closer. Is that enough? It's not enough. Uh, uh, so we want another two requirements. We want to improve the ocean estimate. Not only that there is less uncertainty, but the estimate is better. And we want that this improved estimates um, improves the seasonal forecast skill or the forecast skill. So we know, I mean, this is an example. If you look at the Barton Ocean Reanalysis and you look at the assimilation increments, this is an example. We know that these assimilation increments have a mean, uh, a mean difference, which is not what uh, the methods are not de described. The data assimilation methods are not, uh, they don't target model error usually. But we see, however, that the mean assimilation increments correct the mean. It corrects the total ocean heat content and the slope of the thermocline. Uh, so in this case. So this is important because it has implications for the temporal variability, as I am going to say. Right. The observing system is changing continuously. And here you see the observation distribution on uh, June 1982, that was a very, um, I think it were, was a world meteorological year or something like that. And we had an unprecedented, then unprecedented coverage of ocean observation. In 2005, the observations you can see with the advent of Argo, we have observations almost everywhere in the Southern Hemisphere and, uh, and the subtropics. And these are time series of how the different components of the observing system has been changed. Uh, I mean, you can uh, guess where I'm going. Uh, if the model has errors and the observations are changing, what will happen with the main state of the uh, estimation of the interannual variability from reanalysis? And here is what uh, we see. This is one example, one of the first uh, uh, early works that uh, I did when we were doing the first reanalysis at the CMWA, ocean reanalysis. We had um, one, uh, we always call one experiment that is controlled, that one experiment that doesn't use data simulation and ocean uh, force with um, observed SSTs and forcing. Uh, and we could see the depth of the thermocline in the equatorial Atlantic. It would be this uh, red or black line. However, in the experiment with simulation, when the pirata armories were introduced, we, they produce a huge jump uh, and they corrected the state, the diffuse and the depth of the thermocline in the, in the Atlantic. This uh, jump is huge. And if you don't know where it comes from, it may be mistaken by a spurious um, variability. So you want to avoid that. And the way that uh, uh, we devised to avoid that was to say, okay, let's take the information of the observations now and try to extrapolate it into the past. And this is uh, uh, basically by adding a bias correction on the, on the tendencies of the model. And this bias correction had two terms. One, that it was um, a priori estimated from the recent observations, and the other that it was estimated online. It's estimated online, in fact. Uh, and we apply this term retrospectively. And in fact, if we apply that, we avoid or ameliorate these problems with the jumpiness. And that's what you see here in the, in the blue curve. So uh, just to give an, an idea, this is the um, 
for an argo period, we can get these terms, these correction terms that we apply to the model. And the observing system will always be changing. So for reanalysis, not only ocean, but also atmosphere, we really need to have these uh, corrections of the tendencies as, by extrapolating the observation information in the past. This is polemic and is by no means without flaw, but it's very important. Uh, so once we do that, what, uh, uh, if you remember, one of the questions that I had is, does this data simulation improve the interannual variability? And one thing that we do is to compare with records um, of um, essential climate variables to see whether we improve the temporal correlation. And that's what you see here. Uh, this is the control when we don't assimilate observations. When we assimilate observations, we get better correlation with the altimeter sea level. Of course, if we assimilate uh, altimeter sea level, this correlation improves further, uh, which is not so surprising. But what is uh, the challenge here would be with the, uh, that the to be able to project the altimeter information that is only on the sea surface into the depth. And this is it has a little effect, not that much, but it improves the mean state, the, the subsurface. So those are the criteria that we do if you ever go into this game of doing, of initializing seamless models. And the final, the final requirement is does the data simulation improve the forecast scale? And again, we only have, always have one uh, run initialized without observation, that would be the blue. And the red is when assimilate observations. And it, and it improves, and then we are very happy. <laughs> uh, and this shows that in our current system, it would be in system five. This shows how the skill of the system on ENSO has been improving over the years. Uh, this is the system five. If we didn't assimilate observations, we will have the skill of 15 years back. So the simulating the ocean observations is equivalent of 15 years of progress on model development. I say that because uh, um, it is quite important. I think it's, the, it's hard, but it's the way to go. And uh, there are many other attempts of saying, OK, maybe we, don't need, we only need SST. You can imagine, and I think that was uh, uh, this syntax system and for decadal forecasting, sometimes it's said if you only have sea surface temperature and you have a couple model where you nudge the sea surface temperature, that should be enough to initialize decadal or seasonal forecast. Or we tried to quantify and to see whether it was true. And of course, this the answer could be system dependent, but what we see in our system is that the ocean observations so first, atmospheric observations are essential. So re atmospheric reanalysis are essential, and that would be the contribution of what they call winds here. Ocean observations are also very important. And uh, the, comp the combined two, it increased the scale by 25% in several areas. The only area where that is pro it was problematic at that time was the equatorial Atlantic. And I think if we see this, it's because there is something wrong with our methodology. So this is an area to pay attention and try to improve the methodology, not try to remove the observation. That's... So which other approaches exist for initializing our system predictions? So uh, at the, um, some time ago, and um, perhaps uh, now uh, as well, we have these two different paradigms that uh, because we have the real world and the model world. Uh, for the medium range, we tend to initialize everything on the on the real world, and we call this full initialization. And being close to the real world is perceived um, as an advantage because the model slowly drifts into its own mean state, and that's the figure that I showed at the beginning. The, this process of drifting means that we have a skill at the, in the early uh, times. Um, and the decadal uh, predictions at this, uh, some years ago, things have been changing. And, but at the time that we did this work, it was very controversial. The, what it was uh, proposed was to do anomaly initialization to avoid forecast drift 
and uh, the idea would be to initialize about the model attractor or mean state. And that was called anomaly initialization. But then uh, if we go for this dichotomy, well, what happens with the seamless forecasting? No, It would not be possible really. Where is seasonal? Is it closer to the real world or to the model world? Uh, so the other comment is that uh, uh, anomaly initialization doesn't mean necessarily initializing in the model attractor. Uh, so, uh, in fact, sometimes it's not at all. And you can achieve initialization in the model attractor with full initialization. But we have seen uh, so far, or I hope I have conveyed, that um, uh, the full initialization, that is the one that I presented, had two main caveats. Uh, or problems is one is the initialization shock resulting from unbalanced state and the non-linearities and non-stationarities. So let's try, we did some work trying to compare this full initialization with anomaly initialization. So the full initialization, as I said, is uh, uh, what we do in the ocean is as in the medium range forecast in the atmosphere except that the model bias is taken into account during the data simulation. The a posteriori calibration of the forecast is needed, and this calibration depends on lead time and on initial date. So it's quite expensive because you have to do quite a lot of reforecast. Uh, and finally, if this initialization is uncoupled, the model, whatever we learn about the model drift during the data simulation cannot be applied in the forecast, which is a bit. Uh, with couple data simulation, maybe we can estimate this bias during the initialization process and propagate the forecast. What about the anomaly initialization? I represent it in this diagram, and the idea is to conduct a long uh, couple integration to estimate the model climate of this only one realization for many years. And then you have uh, initialized with an observed anomaly to superimpose the observed anomaly, and then you get this information. Uh, so what are the benefits and the cons and the, and the pros? So the original purpose was to avoid expensive reforecast. So if you have a look at these forecasting systems, and the full initialization is much more expensive than the anomaly initialization because of the number of reforecasts. In this case, the model climatology doesn't depend so much on the lead time. But uh, this is not enough because uh, with this, this long integration doesn't give you any idea of the skill of the system and you need provide an indication of the scale. So that's not enough. You still need three forecasts for a scale assessment. And uh, the other thing is that calibration is still needed. Even if you do um, put the observed anomaly, these models still drift because the, the anomaly initialization is not always perfect and there are initialization shocks. The other problem that it has is that you always need to define the anomaly. So what happens if you have observations uh, for first time, you can unless you have a reanalysis, you don't know what is the anomaly. So this anomaly initialization indirectly always depends on some full reanalysis being done. Uh, the, there is something interesting regarding the bias is that this anomaly initialization acknowledge that the, there is model error during the initialization, but uh, we call it this. Um, the bias, uh, the algorithm for data simulation is called bias blind because it removes the bias instead of correcting. So if you compare these two um, uh, experiments, in this case, these two equations, here we are removing the bias, here we are correcting. Just to give you an idea of what are the pros and, well, the pros and cons, the, the algorithms. I don't know how I'm so, doing I don't want to rush you, but if you could wrap up, it would be great so that there's time yeah. for questions. Okay. But it seems then, you're on your last point. Yeah. Uh, no, just to say, uh, I don't. I have some slides on ensemble generation, but maybe I don't need to say much about it. I will leave the the slides uh, with you. Um, 
basically what I want to say here is that uh, uh, for seamless to represent the uncertainty on the ocean, instead of using optimal sampling, uh, which it could be possible, but it will need modification, the linear propagation or generalized propagations to compute the singular vectors. What we do is more sort of common sense. <laughs> uh, it's just that we know that we have uncertainty. Let's check, take uh, all knowledge of uncertainty and apply it. So we apply this uncertainty, what is the wind uncertainty? What is the uncertainty on the, introduced by the spin-up, by the SST? If possible, we try to put also P minus C, absorb solar radiation, CI. I mean, uh, all these things, and we put this during the for, during the production of the initial conditions. We also um, sample uncertainty by perturbing the observation location, or by doing random thinning instead of superobing. Uh, that allows. This is very good for ensembles because uh, it allows. Um, um, using the observational information differently. And finally, that coupled data simulation allows us to, um, even with this simple scheme of perturbations, it allows us to sample flow dependent um, perturbations, flow dependent errors. And I guess I don't want, I have some examples of how the uncertainty on solar radiation is in a, Uncoupled reanalysis versus, uh, sorry, uncoupled versus coupled. And also, how this uh, in ENSO, uh, how uh, I'm going to go, how with coupled data simulation, we can have this uncertainty precipitation associated with the displacements of the convection and uncertainty of the wind stress associated with the westerly wind burst and MGO. That's all I wanted to say. The couple model is very good. Uh, I mean, that's one of the advantages of couple data simulation, flow dependent, a natural way of representing flow dependent uncertainty. So I want to finish now. Uh, we have seen uh, some criteria to design a good initialization uh, for their system, uh, trying to reduce the initialization shock. Uh, we have seen the needs for drift and calibration and the need um, for historical stable records of um, initial conditions consistent with the real time. And we have also seen the importance of treating the model error during the data simulation processes and exploiting the observational information, uh, extrapolating it into the past. Uh, I try to go a little bit some examples on the initialization of the ocean for seasonal forecast. That is important to initialize the dynamical and thermodynamical processes. Um, and being aware that the data simulation changes the mean state. Uh, so we need to treat the bias. And that even if it's challenging, it's worth assimilating observation. Um, I try to see what are different other alternative approaches and try to do a comparison between the full versus normal initialization. And at the end, very quickly, I went about how to represent uncertainty. Very happy to get questions, so you can send me an email. And that's it. Thank you. I Thank you so much. Um, I, I would love to ask. The question uh, <laughs> can you go through all the steps in the last section of your paper but I think um, may maybe we do this in a full-blown seminar um, because it it's super interesting the whole issue about ocean initialization and, and uncertainties mm -hmm.